Welcome to the Wednesday, October 10th, 2012 uh, meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, can we have the roll call? Chairman Lennon? Here. Councillor Guvenali? Here. Councillor Jordan? Here. Councillor Ray? Here. Councillor Sherman? Here. Councillor Sullivan? Here. And Councillor Walsh? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of, of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Town Council reports and correspondence. Jessica? Thank you, Sarah. A um, couple things. Um, the Appointments Committee is going to be accepting applications from residents uh, in, interested in serving in, on various town boards and commissions. Um, by the middle to end of next week, the actual list of the vacancies that are coming up will be online, and citizens can apply online as well. So wanted to get that out. Uh, a couple of library items. The library bond is coming before the voters on November 6. The Board of Trustees of the Library is, hol is holding an open house at the library this Sunday, the 14th, from 3 to 5 p.m. There will be refreshments and you'll be able to tour around the facility and look at what's needed and what the options are. And I would like to just, I don't know if the council is all aware of this, but there's something very interesting that has begun at the library, and this is a program called Reading to Winston. There was a photograph in the recent Courier, but Winston is a golden retriever and a therapy dog, and for children in grades K through four, can go, and re can go to the library have an appointment and read to Winston for 15 minutes. <laughs> this has been hugely popular and successful as, a, as a, an inspirational reading program. Um, you can register, you need to register to do this if you're interested, and you can call the library at 799-1720. Thanks. Jim? Sarah, I just want to um, thank Ted, uh, Ted Jordan and the AP government classes at the high school for uh, the work that they've done over the last several weeks. They've invited pretty much any candidate that has run for anything, <laughs> either at the local level, state level, and I believe they even had uh, Angus King come to their class, which is pretty impressive. But it was pretty amazing to see these young people and how they conducted themselves, and they did run a, um, a recent candidate's night and uh, Francesca Governale was one of the moderators, and I was ex explaining to Frank that I was particularly impressed with how she handled the timekeeping element, because we have a tendency to go on and on and on and on, but she was very clear about stop, you know, with everything <laughs> signed. So. But Ted Jordan is to be complimented for picking up this uh, responsibility and providing the, the town with some access to information that, so they can make an informed decision on election day. Thank you. Jessica? If I may, Sarah, I forgot to say one more thing about Winston. Winston is a certified therapy dog. So for small people who might be a little worried about that, he's a certified therapy dog. He's a lovely dog. And his handler is Barbara Schenkel. Thanks. Frank? Um, Sarah, last, um, I think it was last week, um, uh, the town, re two weeks ago maybe now, the town received the uh, consultant study on capital planning, uh, which was a, a fairly uh, hefty uh, piece of work looking at the capital uh, requirements uh, of the town, total town, schools and municipal buildings, um, to assess long-term capital needs and requirements on a, on a long-term basis. And um, uh, Mike and uh, Meredith, the superintendent of the schools, uh, reviewed that with the consultant and then uh, subsequent to that meeting uh, Michael Moore the chair the, uh, the uh, finance chair of the school board and myself met with them to uh, discuss it uh, Mike uh, sent the council a summary version of summer page of uh, what they've, they've concluded thus far from the study and I think it's worth noting that uh, that is a public document that Mike sent out and that people should be aware of and that we'll be doing more work on looking at long-term capital needs um, on a holistic basis for town and schools going forward. Thank you. Any others? Uh, okay. So now is the opportunity for any citizens out there who wish to speak on a topic that's not on tonight's agenda. You'll have a chance for all the topics on the agenda, but if you have something else you want to say, feel free to come up. 
Seeing none, uh, town manager's report. I'll pass this evening. Okay. Other than, did you want to mention the shore road pathway dedication? I didn't. Um, oh, do you want me to yeah. mention it? Okay. Um, as many of you know, because I see a lot of the same faces, um, on Monday we had a dedication of the new shore road pathway, and to I think all of our astonishment, about 200 people it seemed like showed up, which was amazing, and half of them had walked from the walked, biked, jogged, skipped, jumped, rollerbladed from the town center to the, the, the fort for the celebration, which was really a, a wonderful added touch. In fact, I got to be one of the flag people and see the groups of kids coming by. Andy's group was first, of course, with lots of kids in tow and baby strollers. Um, anyway, it was a really, really, I thought, wonderful, low-key event, and it was just all uh, upbeat and happy, and people could not be more thrilled that um, after many, many years of planning and hard work, the Shore Road Pathway is almost complete, and I think we've all noticed that people are using it a lot. So thank you, everyone, who helped put that together. There's, there's really too many names even to, to go over, but many, many people contributed to making that event. Um, happened seamlessly, probably most notably Maureen. So thank you to all, and thank you those for those who came. Deb might like to update on absentee voting. Do you want to update? Sure. Absentee voting uh, is going on now. We're actually voting right here in the council chambers during regular office hours of the town hall, which is Monday, 7.30 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, 7.30 till 4. There is a deadline if you would like to request a ballot or vote absentee. That is Thursday, November 1st. So if you know right now you're not going to be in town or your preference is to vote absentee, uh, please come here to the town hall. If you have any questions, uh, you can give us a call. And the information is also online. Uh, one of the main uh, features at www.capeelizabeth.com is regarding the election. You can also uh, either view and or print and download the specimen ballots, both for the state <coughs> election and for the municipal. So that information is there for you as well. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to uh, turn our attention to the recipient of this year's uh, Ralph, Ralph T. Gould um, Award for Outstanding Citizenship. And this year, I'm thrilled to announce that it goes to John Mitchell. Um, and we will do a little ceremony down at the podium. John, do you, do you want to join us? Is he joining us over there? And Deb, will you come? Because we can. I thought it might be helpful. I just thought it would be nice to hear all the past recipients of the award because they're all, it's a very impressive list um, that John is now joining. So I asked Deb to read it. Great. It is my honor to read these names, and the award began in 1986. Ralph T. Gould, George W. Bill Orchid, Judith C. Simons, E. Irving Chapel, Richard B. O'Donnell, Henry C. Adams, Loretta A. Pond. Dr. Peter W. and Alice H. Rand, John J. Civilly, Wendy Derzewick and Ellen Van Fleet, William H. Jordan Sr., Leland P. Murray Jr., Nancy Masterton, Gilbert S. Jordan, Evelyn M. and James F. Cox, Charles F. Wilson, Nancy H. Miles, Carolyn M. Fritz, Michael T. Ott, and Anne Swift Kayata. Thank you very much. So before we uh, present John with his plaque, um, I just had a few words to say about him, brag about him. Um, John is a very, ta most of you will know some of this, but John's a very talented landscape architect. Um, and I, I say the word landscape in the broadest sense, as he really does re-envision scapes of all kinds. Um, parks, pathways, schools, open space, wetlands, town centers, homes, developments, you name it, John has had a hand in it. Um, he's infused the character of uh, so many places in Cape Elizabeth and made them more beautiful and more usable um, and more uh, integrated in a way into what their natural place should be. He has a, a touch for, for uh, preserving the natural landscape and yet making it more uh, able to be used by people. Um, 
It was John's brilliance, uh, working in collaboration with a few other people, that they reconfigured the entrance to the fort that we know it today, where the road comes in next to the cliff, and you see that beautiful green field, and then you get that jaw-dropping view of the ocean and the ship channel, and then the lighthouse. Um, so John was one of the masters behind that. Um, he was a successful bidder to prepare the first illustrations for the town center design in 1995. Um, that is now being used in South Portland in Ferry Village and also its Capes AB district um, that we are gradually reconfiguring. Um, John served for 11 years on the very beginning of the land trust uh, committee. He was the stewardship chair and helped to acquire some of the very first land that the, that the land trust we know as CELT now um, has been so successful. And, um, you know, whenever John works on a town project, he puts in so many hours because he's so um, dedicated and passionate. And he doesn't ever bill us for all of them. Um, and he doesn't really tell us how many extra hours he's put in. And we never ask because we kind of figure with all these beautiful grandchildren he has, I think they're seven and counting, that he's going to come knocking on our door someday to collect when he has to fork over for all those college tuitions and lavish weddings that we know he's going to provide for them. So we just want it to be your own secret how many pro bono hours you've given us. Um, John prepared the concept plan for the Shore Road Path in 2009. Um, walking it many, many, many times, so he's probably memorized it. Um, and then, of course, when it came around again, finally, last year, or two years ago, I guess they started designing it, he again designed and redesigned, I don't know how many times, until he made the Shore Road Pathway Committee um, happy. So we really owe the pathway uh, to him. He's also a member of the Arboretum Committee and has done uh, work with them, thank you. And he continues to assist in almost every way he can in preserving and beautifying Fort Williams. Um, John's a respected and very thoughtful, um, John's respected and thoughtful in his high, high quality work. Uh, there's a list of projects uh, so long that I, I started to write them all down and name them, but I realized I'd take 10 minutes. So uh, believe me when I say that um, he's, he's escorted many, many projects from dream to completion. Um, and the projects, I was struck by how um, broad they are in just nature. There was so, it's not like he only does one thing. He's worked on virtually any, anything you could possibly imagine in terms of a, a space that people would be in. So um, he's just an impressive person. He's given so much to the town of Cape Elizabeth in just so many um, ways. Um, always is here for planning board meetings. He's always patient. He's gracious. He's, he'll answer questions. I know I must have called him five times on the Shore Road Pathway. Probably every other counselor did too. And always just uh, kind. Um, and if this weren't enough, um, as we all know, he's surrounded by a lot of gorgeous and brainy and athletic women who keep him much younger than his years. Um, in the words of his daughter, Andy, quote, my dad has a lot of passions, family, especially his grandchildren, uh, sailing, golfing, traveling, sports. He always tries to fit it all in. When we were young, his days were long with planning board and council meetings all around the state and running long into the night. Dad always had a vision to see things the way they could be while preserving the character of the land. He's proud of Cape Elizabeth and the way they've approached projects over the years, and he was happy to be part of it all. So it's my great honor to award this year's Ralph Gould for excellent, outstanding citizenship. John. So thank you, John. Do you want to say it? Thank you. Say yeah. A couple, couple words. <clears throat> wow. Um, first of all, I want to say that it's so nice to stand up here now and not have to present a, a, another <laughs> controversial project. Um, but uh, seriously, this is, uh, this is very humbling uh, to stand here and receive this award, uh, the Ralph T. Gould Award. Uh, Sue and I have, uh, we've always felt fortunate uh, when we moved to Maine and settled in Cape Elizabeth. Um, we've always felt fortunate that we settled here and, and raised our family. Uh, it truly is a, a very special community. 
Um, it's been a privilege to be part of uh, so many of the community projects and, and to serve on committees um, that I've been involved with over the years, both professionally and as a volunteer. Um, I first want to thank all of the great people that I've worked with and served with uh, over the years. Um, these, are, uh, these are very dedicated citizens and committee members and board members and, and town employees that have, um, uh, that have really helped to uh, change the character or, or to make Cape Elizabeth what it is. Um, and thank you for allowing me to, um, to be part of that, uh, part of that process. Uh, thank you, councillors. Um, this is uh, truly an honor to receive this award, and uh, it means an awful lot to me. Thank you. And then finally, a big thank you to my family, uh, who are all, I think they're all here tonight. None of them <laughs> skipped out. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy uh, that you all made it uh, some from far away and especially to my wife, Sue, who has always supported me uh, in, in along the way. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. doesn't need my permission to do anything. Uh, okay. Let them. Do I have a motion to accept the draft minutes from, from our September 10th meeting? So moved. Second. Any comments, changes, edits? All those in favor? Um, okay, item 124-2012, Ocean House Pizza Malt and Venice license renewal applications. Do we have a motion? Um, I move that we approve the renewal malt and Venice license application from CAG Pizza Inc. doing business as Ocean House Pizza at 337 Ocean House Road. Seconded. Discussion? I noticed in reviewing the application that their license had expired. So I would like to know what is the procedure, what, what happens when that occurs. It expired on September 6th. Mike? Yep. Um, when the um, owner became aware of um, the expiration date of the license, they immediately contacted the state of Maine, and the state of Maine asked for a letter from the town, which I provided, uh, that they would be on the next available council agenda. Um, the September meeting had already passed, and this was the next available, and um, so they immediately got that information to the state, and um, they'll be awaiting uh, the license following tonight, if it, if it is indeed. So then does the state uh, consider them uh, that they are allowed to continue? That is my understanding okay. that that, right, the pending uh, action tonight allowed them uh, to continue for that uh, period of time. And then would you tell me again when then this next deadline will be for, were there, it, what's the extension year, date? They're yeah. a year. They're good for One a year. year so but the, okay. yeah, this time next year. Any other questions, discussion? All those in favor? Um, <clears throat> item 125-2012, the Winnick Wood Shrub uh, Land Management Project. Um, Maureen, do you want to say a few things before we have a motion? happy to give you as much information as you want. I'm also happy to be really brief. But uh, 
Kate O'Brien from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also here. She's the one that provided the brochures that you have at your, your, your seats tonight, and she's our expert on wildlife management, so if you have any questions regarding that, she's the person you want to talk to. Mike Duddy is also here. Mike is the town's tree warden. Um, he's also a former member of the Conservation Commission, so he is very familiar with Winnick Woods, and we're fortunate that he is a licensed Maine forester, so he's been able to uh, kind of shepherd this project through as well. He contributed a lot to the habitat management plan, and he would be supervising the project. But basically what we're talking about is Winnick Woods. And I'm sorry, oh gosh. Garvin Donegan is the chair of the Conservation Commission. Uh, they wrote the Winnick Woods Master Plan, which the council subsequently adopted. They're familiar with this project tonight, and Garvin is here to, to show the, represent the Conservation Commission's support for the project. But Winnick Woods is a 71-acre parcel that was donated to the town. It's on Sawyer Road, which is right here. And we're talking about this one chunk here, which is about 12 acres. The master plan called for setting that aside as a shrubland management area for the New England cottontail. And we knew we would need to do some stuff to it. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Kate, was involved th at that time. And she offered to partner with us. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service owns an adjacent 10-acre parcel. So between the two pieces, uh, there's the potential for approximately a 25-acre wildlife habitat um, that that we would use with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But it needs some work, and that costs money. And most of the Winnick Woods Master Plan was implemented by the Conservation Commission with only their annual appropriations. So this is really kind of a, a great boon to us that the Wildlife Management Institute has stepped up and said that they would help with the costs of managing this, this area for wildlife habitat. And Mike Duddy would be supervising the work that would be done, and Kate is helping us to make sure we do it correctly. So um, instead of me talking anymore, unless you have questions or you'd like to hear from someone else, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Okay. Are there any citizens who'd like to speak on this? Okay, so why don't we get a motion? And then we can discuss it. Dave? Uh, I move that the Council approve a partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Wildlife Management Institute for Shrub Land Management on the Winnick Woods property as outlined in the memorandum dated September 29, 2012. Second. Okay. Discussion? Jim? Um, well, I talked to Maureen today because we received um, a letter from um, Jay Cox. You probably read that this afternoon. And I reviewed that with, uh, with Maureen just to get a sense of the meeting that, that was held between the two. And he is apparently satisfied with the discussion and with what the plan is going forward. So I was glad to hear that, but I wanted to make sure, read into the record, that Jay's email was received by us. And, and my, just a procedural question about this. When we adopt something like this, should we be moving it to a public hearing prior to a complete adoption? I, just a procedural question, and I don't know whether Michael could address that. Just yeah. because some people may not be aware of what we're doing. Yeah. There's no formal requirement of a, a public hearing on a, on a partnership that the town does. Uh, this is of some duration, it's not forever. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really up to the council. Uh, you know, we, we've tried to get some word out about it. Uh, you, we sent notice to all the different abutters. Uh, we heard from one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's been opportunity for the, those who are apt to be most interested to know about it, to know about it. All right. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Yeah. I just had, um, I just was wondering how long this, this partnership might, might last. I know it's kind of an open-ended question, but. And the other question I had, perhaps Mike Duddy can answer, is just kind of a definition question that it was, I had. The, the agreement that you're being asked to allow the manager to sign basically is an agreement that allows the Wildlife Management Institute onto the property to do the management activities. And so once we hire the contractor and he's done, then that's done. Um, if you want to talk to Michael about how long it will take, I know he's, he's, it would be work that would be done in the depths of winter when everything's frozen. Um, and 
the idea would be that you would go in there when the ground is frozen, you would take out the, the trees that are there. There's still going to be a lot of shrubs left over because it's still a pretty scrubby, shrubby area. And then when spring comes and the sun hits the ground, it's just going to explode with, with new shrub growth. So we're expecting it to look pretty good fairly quickly. And would, would, uh, would this partnership last beyond this next spring? I mean, is this a five-year, it didn't really It's say, a but. pretty limited, I mean, it's, they're paying the work, they're paying us for this work that is going to be done. Um, we have a master plan that's been adopted by a council that said, we want to manage this for wildlife habitat. And then we're partnering up with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service so that, you know, they can actually come to us and say, gee, we look, you know, it looks like things are going well, or um, maybe we need to look at some invasives, but we're getting some free expertise and we're getting some money to do the work we need to do and we're not really obligated to do anything but let them on the property yeah. just if I might you know, this is this is all about pre preserving a habitat for a, a species that list that's the uh, state list is endangered and you know but at the same time these things only have these habitats that they, they go through a period of, of of life and you try to manage it for some time but then eventually nature forces take over. Maybe Kate could explain better at the microphone uh, the extent to which, you know, these things typically uh, last. But the initial, you know, as Maureen says, the initial management is just briefly, but we really hope that, you know, we'll provide a, a, a longer term uh, habitat for the, the critters. Sure, thank you. Um, first of all, this is completely voluntary. Um, Cape Elizabeth is a special town. You blessed to actually have a lot of shrub and wildlife, the New England cottontail, a lot of bird life. We're looking to partnership with the town, but it is completely voluntary. This is your land, your choice, and um, your decision. So we're happy to work with you for as long as you would like. Um, if it's something that you do habitat management and you want to step away and say revert it back to forest, that is you know, obviously completely um, your decision. This habitat type, especially when you're um, talking about a forested habitat, it is temporary. So its suitability for the species probably will be somewhere between three to maybe 15 years post management. Um, so if there is still interest in managing for the species, it would be something that we might want to revisit again in 12 to 15 years. Um, some of your other habitats that are more coastally moderated that are naturally maintained as shrubland, um, they, you know, like some of the state parks, are probably more likely to persist through time. If that answers oh, your question. You. Yeah. Thank you so much for partnering with us. Thank you. Sounds like we're getting the good end of the deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I had a question for Mike Duddy. Mike, I, I was reading this, and I, I could have looked this up, but I thought, I knew you'd be here this evening, and I thought, given your experience and you are our forest, what's, this, what's the exact title? Are you, are you a tree warden? I am the town's appointed tree warden, that's right. correct. Uh, what is slash? That is the, typically the, the leftover crown um, branches and stems that um, aren't necessarily chipped and are left on the ground. It's the sort of debris post harvesting. Okay. All right. Thanks. And then the other question was, how long? Um, the idea is to clear out a lot of these trees so that shrubs can grow, so that the shrub right. habitat for the the New England cottontail. I'm just wondering how long um, will it last? I mean, is it just you know, because it can reforest, and I think mm -hmm. probably that question was already sort of answered, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, it depends on I the... Mean, I think it's wonderful that this is going to happen, but I hope. Uh, as Kate was saying, anywhere, I mean, it's a broad range depending on how quickly um, pioneer species come in, anywhere from 3 to 15 years, in my view, I'm thinking 7 to 10 years before, if we want to keep it at a certain um, shrub level, of um, shrubs of up to two inches diameter, roughly up to 12 feet high. In about 10 years, you're gonna to wanna to come, uh, come back through and do some sort of treatment. But because it will be shrubland versus forest land, it's gonna be a much less expensive treatment um, and much more easily achieved. 
So once we get it back to a, a shrubland um, successional stage, it's easier to keep it there versus what we're trying to do now, which is have it revert to what it was previously. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just make one quick comment. Alice Larea uh, was the name of the, the person who donated this property to us. She was the daughter of uh, Lou and Ruth Winnick, who lived in an old farmhouse right across from this property. And what, what she really loved about this property, one, she remembered as a young girl going over playing in it, but particularly it was the meadows and it was, and it was seeing animals like rabbits. And you know, I remember speaking to her very clearly. So, you know, I, I think, you know, the original, you look at, you know, why you were giving land and, and why certain intent. And in, in my view, this is in perfectly in keeping with the intent of the donor. Uh, and I, I think sh she'd be absolutely thrilled to see it managed for wildlife uh, in, this, in this fashion. Uh, any further comments? All those in favor? Thank you all for coming and doing this. It's, it, it's wonderful. Okay, item uh, 126, 2012. This is the Ordinance Committee's proposal regarding properties offering short-term rentals. We are going to after some conversation, vote to set it for a public hearing on Wednesday, November 14th. But before we get started, I see some people in the audience. Is there anyone who wants to come speak on this topic? I'm getting comfortable. I know. <laughs> Don't forget your name and address. Oh, I'm, I've got it written right here. I'm not that comfortable, though. Um, I want to assert my view. And um, hello, my name is Jennifer Aronson. I live at number 27 Lawson Road. And you received my emails regarding a short-term rental at number 31 Lawson Road last week. Listen, the problems this past week are a perfect example of why I want short-term rentals banned in my neighborhood. Clearly, I introduced myself to the renters last week on Tuesday. Sat you can tell that from the emails I sent you. Saturday, I called the police when their photographer was standing in the middle of my yard, not at the edge, in the middle. I asked him to leave and informed him I was calling the police. He left immediately. Officer Dorval arrived, and I said, did you see all the cars? And he said, what cars? And I said, come on, I'll show you. And see this one, it's blocking the road. And he said, it's not blocking the road. And I said, I don't think a rescue could get by, really. Um, I was astounded by his lack of observation, and it made me very, very uncomfortable. After walking in my yard, he went next door to speak to the renters. He returned and told me that they moved the car, and the photographer had left as soon as I had asked. I replied, I know he left, but I was told to call the police if someone's in my property. The officer replied, I'm going to have to talk to my boss about this on Monday morning. The officer concluded by telling me a bus would be on the street later that night, bringing them all home from the wedding, implying, please don't call the police again. We already know about it. After the officer left, more cars appeared. They were getting ready for the wedding, and there were nine cars scattered all over, clearly blocking access for any emergency vehicles. So was I supposed to call the police again? Did I mention that my neighbor had called the police two days earlier because of all of these cars? So who's supposed to manage this mess? And, you know, I'm looking at the short-term rental zoning amendments that you all have sent out. And I don't understand substantiated complaint. I didn't see a definition in there, and maybe that's my uh, misreading. But I think that... Uh, Residents in a neighborhood should know what a substantiated complaint is because to me having to sit on a beautiful Saturday afternoon and call the police and then wait for the police to come, that's a strike for me. Um, innocent trespassing, I feel badly for these people walking across my lawn. They don't know it's somebody else's property apparently, but is that a strike? Um, blocking the street innocently, is that a strike? Who's going to count the number of tenants at 11 o'clock at night in these houses? Because I see that's one of the considerations. Am I going to have to go ring a doorbell and ask everybody to come out and count them? I have to call the police to come and count these people? Um, will tenants be required to read the addendum to the rental agreement with the good neighbor guidelines? Will they have to take a quiz and pass it after they read this agreement, demonstrating that they understand the agreement? 
um, three strikes should mean the renter is out permanently. I don't think 12 months is long enough. And you know, finally, the language at the bottom of page 13 refers to renters and to residents. And my belief is a resident should be the short-term renter in a small lot neighborhood with no history of renting. Otherwise, we're allowing money-making businesses into our residential neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Anyone else? <clears throat> Um, Patty Grennan, uh, 8C Barnard. I'm just quick, two points that I want to make. Um, I guess I'll just start by saying I think that generally this has been a long and hard process, and I think typically when you have two sides of anything, a butters and a <coughs> and really I don't think either side ends up happy, it probably means you're doing a pretty good job. It means that you're coming up with a compromise. Um, hopefully over time, will see that this will work or not work and then make adjustments. Two points that I want to make. The first is um, hopefully some of you or got an email from Pete Clifford. I just want to say it on record today that, that okay, and we've talked about it before, you're shaking your head yes, so that the, we need to address some of the amendments to the language before this is passed on to make sure that someone can't lease a home and it not be um, owned by them. The owner needs to be um, the person who signed, takes out the short-term rental permit. Um, I think we need to really, because that's clearly um, uh, you know, um, a blatant, you know, business. Um, the second thing is, um, with looking at the three strikes and you're out, um, you're reading that, that somebody can lose, um, which is, you know, um, a hardship for someone who's renting their home and to lose money for a year. But I, I'm wondering if we can't consider taking it one step further. Because if something, if a short-term rental does three strikes, they lose it for a year. They come and they get another permit. As the uh, draft reads right now, they could continue to get three strikes, lose for a year, start up again. And this could continue on as a nuisance, as people get you know, lazy or whatever and aren't doing this. What I'd like to see a tightening is that you do three strikes, you're out. You have a year um, of penalty. When that's over, you get another permit. If it happens again, and we, now we're up to another three strikes, at that point, um, we consider this rental an extreme nuisance for the neighborhood, and they're um, no longer allowed to operate that business. I mean, I, th I, I feel like that's a compromise. I feel like it's fair. If, this, if a property has become a, a documented extreme nuisance, it shouldn't be allowed to operate. Um, just something to consider. I'm hoping that those two things you can, perhaps, before you pass this on, I don't know how you handle it procedurally. Um, I don't want this to stall a vote in November, um, but I think that those two points are worth considering. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Anyone else? Jim, I apologize. I should have done this before. Will you set us up with what the Ordinance Committee, just a brief overview of what you guys wrestled with, what your thinking was, and what you're proposing, just for the record, what you're proposing okay, well, this evening? You know, okay, I can do that. That's not a problem. It was in the packet for all of you as well. But just very just brief. A, just over. here with us for a second here. Let me just kind of refresh everybody's memory. Um, uh, first of all, this was um, forwarded to the Ordinance Committee back in September 2011, so this is over a year's worth of uh, time. So uh, the committee, that particular committee met seven times, forwarded its recommendations from, to the Town Council who then forwarded them to the Planning Board. Uh, and the Planning Board met two times and obviously had some public comment as well. Um, what's important to understand is that we've had Numerous folks attend the ordinance committee meetings. Um, some of the folks here in the audience here should be permanent members of the ordinance committee because they've been at every event. We appreciate your input. Um, it was somewhat interactive at, at, at every stage. So um, there was, uh, had Maureen do the calculation, over five hours worth of testimony has been received um, on this subject. In addition to many of us visiting neighborhoods that were impacted by the questions that were on the table as well as the many emails and letters regarding the short-term um, rental issue and the Ordinance Committee's efforts. What we have in front of you today for you to consider to send to public hearing next week, uh, essentially, um, it's, um, we, we made minor revisions to what the Planning Board came back to us to specify and clarify many of the proposals. The changes made by the Ordinance Committee were largely policy adjustments as detailed be below. And um, listening to a lot of the input at the very last stages, we did make some modifications. We also had 
uh, many um, citizens who participated and listened to our workshop and reminded us of the conversations that we had during that time. And let me just um, outline for you the changes from the planning board recommendation. The first one, we define short-term rental guest has, has been augmented and clarified to state that anyone present on the property after 11 p.m. would be considered a tenant. Number two, uh, we took the short-term rental parking requirement and we um, required that guest parking um, be deleted and then we capped four parking spaces to be established. We addressed the applicability section, which was the subject of, of a considerable amount of discussion, even in the final phases of developing what we have here. It's been adjusted to make clear that the minimal rental period is seven days. This does not permit a landlord or a tenant for renting less than seven days, but the remaining days in that partial week rental would have to be days that the rental is vacant. The revised wording also avoids any interpretation that rentals cannot turn over on the same day or that there isn't time for cleaning or resetting up the particular rental. The fourth uh, bullet is a requirement that the landlord inform the tenants about event rules it's been changed um, to information on the maximum number of tenants and guests allowed. In addition, the landlord is required to provide the tenants with a copy of the miscellaneous offenses ordinance, which was one of the issues that uh, Jenny just mentioned in her testimony a few minutes ago about what the, what the information is that we would disclose to tenants. The next bullet, the section has been changed to reinstate the exemption from the stiffer requirements that had come from planning for certain lots less than 30,000 square feet. If you have a short-term rental on a small lot, but you live next door or on the same lot, you're exempted from the cap on the number of tenants, the number of guests, the number of parking spaces. A maximum cap of four parking spaces has also been added for the short-term rental of less than 30,000 square feet. And finally, the suspension and the revocation section, which is this three strikes you're out piece, in response to comments made by the town council at its August 6th workshop, it creates clear three strikes processes for responding to the problem of a short-term rental. The process has been modeled after area disorderly house ordinances and requ requires revocation of a short-term rental permit if three substantiated complaints occur in a three-year period. So essentially that's that's what's changed. That's within, what's in the body of the document. And what we're recommending to you um, tonight, I guess if you're willing to accept a, um, a motion, I mean, there is, um, Mr. Clifford has raised some questions that Maureen and I discussed today. Um, it certainly can be read into the record next week during the, during the open, you know, our public hearing, but it doesn't appear that there was anything there that was substantial that would change anything here. Um, the only other concern I have is if, with some of what we just heard today. I mean, I, you know. So, so give us a motion and we'll talk about procedure, whether we want to tweak the language before the public hearing or, or what? Okay, I move that the town council set a public hearing on Wednesday, November 14th at 7 p.m. Cape Elizabeth Town Hall on the proposed ordinance committee um, recommendation for short-term rentals that is contained in your packet today. Second. Discussion? Dave? Um, I did review Peter Clifford's uh, proposed uh, language for the short-term rental ordinance. I thought the language made a great deal of sense. Uh, I would be interested if, if there was a, more, a majority of the council that was inclined to favor that language, if we could at the very least instruct the town planner uh, to meet with the town attorney to just review that language and make sure that if, if we did want to add that in, that it was up to snuff from our attorney's standpoint. So at least we would then be prepared uh, to include that in the, the final version of the ordinance. Uh, I don't know, Mike, procedurally if that works, but if, if we just have a consensus that that's what we want to yeah, do, then at least we can be ready uh, next month. That's fine. Technically, you, you can't direct a subordinate of the town manager in terms of the organizational structure to do anything, but that would, you know, if you instruct them you. to do yeah. it, it would be Maureen. Yeah, okay, fair enough. And, um, um, the, and the other 
I'm sorry. No, sorry. The other issue, uh, which I hadn't really thought of, that uh, Patty Grennan mentioned was if somebody struck out once and then they started renting again after the year suspension and then they have another strike, it does seem logical to me that enough is enough at that point, uh, that that permit ought to just be revoked once and for all for that particular property owner. Uh, again, if we had some consensus on that point, we could then ask the town manager uh, to ask uh, whomever on the staff would be appropriate to, uh, to, to address that issue with the town attorney. So again, we could be ready uh, for next month because the last thing we want to do in November is try to amend things on the fly. That doesn't usually work out so well. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Patty, you had said that if the person gets three strikes, they get pulled for a year, then they have to get three more strikes, and then they're done. Right. Not one more, three more. Right. So that's, yeah, that's pretty lenient. So in other words, if they're just repeatedly being so bad that the police are being called two separate times, then that would sort of be game over. That's... I'm sorry, you said one more call. I thought it was three more strikes. Okay, I, I misunderstood. I was willing to be, frankly, a little bit more harsh because it seems to me if... <laughs> yeah, I know you will. Uh, just because, it, gosh, if, if they've been read the Riot Act and they lose it for a year and then they come back and do the same old thing, uh, it seems to me enough... Well, what enough. if it's yeah, like so. someone walking across the lawn and they get annoyed, they call... The, sure. it, That's the substantiated... That's, yeah, yeah. yeah like, we need to address I, it. I mean, Sarah, let me, let me just make a, make a point here. You know, this is a live document, okay? We've been working on this thing now for 13 months, okay? <laughs> um, we're going to get a lot of learnings as we move through this. And while I hear where you're coming from, David, and I hear where Patty Grennan is coming from, you know, I, I think we've got to put this in place and figure it out. And if we have to, that second iteration when they get the new permit, we could come up with new permit process for that second, second round. You've been through shutting you down for a year, and then we could, we could make the hurdle even higher on that second round, rather than to simply say, we're going to give you the same privilege with the same set of rules, one strike, two, three, you're done permanently. I, I, I just think I just think that we're, we're rushing ahead of something that we have absolutely no data to support. But and I'm worried just... that we're, we're going we're gonna to continue to um, create this on the fly. And, and I think we've, you know, we've been talking about it. It's time to get something in place. But we've made it very clear in every meeting I've been at that we will make whatever adjustments we have to make to this to have a workable document that is fair to everyone. And that's where I'm coming from on this. And I'm a little, I'm a little concerned that here we are at the 11th hour again, tweaking it in a way that I don't necessarily believe it's clear why we're doing it. Because I don't think we've weighed it all out. We have landlords who are taxpayers who have rights here too. And I just, I'm just very concerned. Mike? Yeah, just briefly, if I might. You know, I, I think we're talking perhaps a couple of substantive issues, but then there's also a couple of technical issues here to make sure that we carry out the intent of what the Ordinance Committee desired. And, and if anything, if, if something gets passed, we want to make sure that we have the tools and resources right. to, to fulfill all the hard work that you've done. What I'd like to suggest is we, we do have the town attorney, as we always do, have one last look at this, and that we have a meeting that not only includes the town planner, but also the chair of the ordinance committee, uh, so that if there are any of those technical pieces that, you know, you, you can provide the input. We already can, you know, if there's other things, I think it's important that your voice be at the table to know that was already discussed, and it was or was not done for certain reasons. So I would hope that, you know, we could have that last check with the town attorney, since so much work has been done on this, uh, with you present, with Maureen, to be sure that, uh, they don't go overboard. So what do we do? Do we, do we, do we attach a, an amendment to my motion? Yes. In, in my view, it's, you, the, your motion is, is fine. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it's normal process whenever we have complicated ordinances that we, that we look at minor technical issues you know, right up until the public hearing. We want to make sure that, that we get the initial document right in terms of the, okay. the policy issues that the Ordinance Committee 
and the council desired to have in the document. Right. Okay. I'm just going to quickly, because Jim, I don't think anyone here is sitting here trying to change anything that's substantive or conceptual or all the hard work. We're just trying to tweak language to make sure that what you have down here actually sort of holds up legally. That's all people are doing. Like the, 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 the points that these guys made were essentially, um, and I think Pete Clifford was trying to do the same thing, to make sure that it reads in such a way that your intent yeah. is put into practice. Nobody's trying to change the nature of your work on the fly. But what you have in front of you has been put through our town attorney, and, and it is, is bona fide and ready for this group to move to to a hearing. We should, I think we should move but to a hearing. But we're more than happy sure. to go back and make sure that we've dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Yeah, I think that's what but people are... There are some substantial sure. issues here that were presented just now that are a bit different and, and I just want to make sure that we're on the right track. Frank? That's all. And then Caleb? I, I guess just speaking um, about the procedural issues from here, I mean, the purpose of the public hearing is to give a, a, a public additional opportunities to suggest changes or comment on this. It's, it's not a situation, I believe, where it's either we voted up or down. There's still opportunities for modification. So uh, I, I wouldn't consider this to be a final document, even though it's, it's a great document. So we, there might be modifications coming out, out of the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, why you have a public hearing. Right. So yep. I guess we're just going a little out of order because we sort of have a mini one now. We should, <laughs> we should we wait. Are, we are. So yeah. let's tweak what, we, what we're comfortable with and then do the rest. So I just wanted to point out the fact that, yeah, the public hearing isn't even until next month, and look at what we've had based off of two people speaking. And so I wanted to take a moment to remind the council about one of the goals that we set about maybe not having an immediate vote after a public hearing and rushing this through. I know this has been worked on for a very long time, but I would not be comfortable having a public hearing on such a heated topic, and we're going to get all kinds of conversation, I'm sure, started next month and then close the public hearing and vote on it. Obviously, this is going to be a touchy subject. A lot of changes are going to be suggested, and I think it's going to be a lot to digest, and I'd like to remind us that maybe we put off the final vote for that extra month like we've discussed. Dave? And I appreciate uh, Caitlin's comment. I, I, I counter that with the fact that this has been on our collective plates for over a year. I think, frankly, residents need closure. I think people who serve in the council need closure, not that it's about us. Uh, but also, I, I'm fully prepared to vote next month. I'm going to be very interested to hear what people say. Uh, the fact that we got some comments that at least I, it seems the majority of us are willing to uh, incorporate at this late date means there is flexibility. But I, I, I think, and also, the, the council changes in November, and we're going to have a new member in December. Uh, I think it's very important, if possible, for us to be ready to vote. I mean, we may decide not to. Uh, but I think given the circumstances, we need to move this forward. And in terms of the tweaking, I, I frankly find it disappointing that the neighbors that uh, Jenny Arison described as we're at the finish line of this process, choose to uh, rent their property uh, to host a wedding with all kinds of cars. Uh, I mean, it seems like they're just inviting the council to uh, impose restrictions that could be, frankly, a lot more restrictive or harsh. So, you know, I, I just I hope I hope these folks will uh, show some good faith in how they handle this in the coming year. But this gets to the issue why they want the owner to actually be the renter because that right. is not the Absolutely. case. And it right. clearly shows you what happens when it isn't. It's a perfect test, test case. So with that, knowing that we will have lots more discussion uh, and, and interchange. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to get to that vote. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, add something in, 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 in to support uh, something that Council Walls just said. I mean, I've been to some of the ordinance meetings that have been going on, and I think it's important to remember that this is a fluid document. This is brand new territory for the town of Cape Elizabeth to be dealing with. And I think that in the next year, presuming we, we vote in an ordinance, it might be a wee bit different from what we have in front of us, who knows, in November, but at any rate, uh, we're going to learn a great deal in the next year or two. And um, I think that it's important to remember that we, the Ordinance Committee, I think, has done an incredible job of trying to get all this information, get something that's, that's 
reasonable, that's measured, and still looking out for the private property rights of landowners, land, uh, landlords, as well as the people who are living next to the issues that have been occurring. And, you know, and the last thing you want to do is knee-jerk into anything. And, of course, that hasn't happened. This has been a long process. So I just want to remind everyone, this is, this is going to be a learning experience for the next few years and maybe longer. Kathy. Um, as a member of the Ordinance Committee, I have to sort of echo what um, Jim said. I think we heard some interesting ideas today um, from some of the people here and from emails. But I think it's important um, that we do what the town manager suggests in that these need to be reviewed and looked at for completion because having gone to many of these meetings, we will wrestle with a bunch of things. We will think, oh, this is a great idea. And then when we try to take a look at it, we realize how much it affects. We think it's a little idea, but it all of a sudden affects a lot. So I would just be cautious that we not um, jump to changes too quickly, that we make sure that they're reviewed. I'm not saying they're not great changes. They might be terrific changes, but that we make sure that we don't jump too quickly. Because um, I know I'm not comfortable with saying, you know, do the majority of us think this is a good idea or that's a good idea? Because it's just been too much time and effort put into this. And, you know, I've heard a couple things tonight and got a couple emails today. And I, I think it needs to go back through the process and I believe we have an ordinance committee meeting next week, do we not? We do. So um, anyway, um, I just want to make sure that we don't have a knee-jerk reaction to something when we've spent so much time going through the different pieces. Good point. OK, so all those in favor of setting it for public hearing next month? Great. Thank you all for coming again. Item 127, 2012, Solid Waste Ordinance Draft Amendments. Do I have a motion? A little less interested in this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I move that the Town Council set a public hearing for Wednesday, November 14, 2012, at 7 o'clock at the Cape Elizabeth Town Hall for the purposes uh, to accept the Solid Waste Ordinance Amendments. Second. Discussion? These are really uh, housekeeping in, in many ways. There are some definitions in here that were clearly required because of the practical side, the operational side of delivering uh, consistency at the, uh, at the transfer center. Um, we've worked with Bob Malley at great length about this, um, and also Mike McGovern, who weighed in on it as well. Michael may want to weigh in on this and add his two cents, but um, it's very straightforward. Uh, there are really no, no unusual pieces to this. Thank you, Ordinance Committee, for housekeeping. That's important, too. <laughs> just Frank? Quick question, just procedurally. Something like this has to go to um, public hearing? It's an ordinance. It's, it's, an it's a requirement. Yep. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, item 128, Fowler Road Truck Traffic Limitation Citizen Request. Um, yes. <laughs> so why don't we have the two people, why don't we get a little background before we have a motion? Thank you. Do you want to go to the microphone and tell us the, okay. <clears throat> First of all, thank you for the opportunity to address the Town Council tonight. My name is Eleanor Guare. I live at 301 Fowler Road. I've lived at Fowler Road for 17 years, um, during which time I've seen an increasingly significant increase in the commercial truck traffic um, on Fowler Road, um, being used as a cut through from Ocean House Road to Bowery Beach Road on a regular basis. And most of the vehicles originate at one pit that's located at the end of Fowler Road at the Ocean House Road intersection. Um, my complaint um, relates to the abuse to the road, um, the disturbance to the residents, and concerns for recreational safety. 
um, triple axle, 14 wheel dump trucks carrying heavy loads of concrete, gravel, sand, and other materials pass continually all day long. Um, I have witnessed as few as 10 trucks, um, up to an estimated of 100 trucks, with the month of September 2012 being the busiest I have experienced. Uh, when the trucks began this level of activity on weekends, um, I wrote to Mike, who asked Sarah if we could put this on the agenda, and I appreciate that. Um, while I have not had the time to gather signatures from the people on Fowler Road, I've spoken to several residents, um, especially those who work at home, like myself, um, about the disruptive noise of the vehicles passing, the rumbling, the vibration, and the squealing associated with brakes on vehicles of this size. Um, the vehicles appear to be driving the speed limit, and we are grateful for that. Um, however, in most places, Fowler Road is only 18 feet wide, um, with absolutely no space outside of the white line on Fowler Road, and two commercial dump trucks attempting to travel in opposite directions at the same time cannot do so without stopping, waiting, pulling over. And in addition, many driveways like my own, <laughs> require backing up onto Fowler Road, where there are many curves and hills that require the residents to navigate with care. One need only drive on Fowler Road to see the damage that these commercial trucks have caused. Um, I wonder how much longer before the road once again requires costly repair, and how much of an inconvenience this will be for the residents. There are 86 residences on Fowler Road. There are alternative routes for these vehicles. Ocean House Road and Bowery Beach Road are excellent choices. They are wider. Um, they are, I guess, what the law calls the busy corridors. Um, they have lanes. They're better maintained. Um, there are fewer homes located close to the road. Um, there are bike paths and running paths on both sides of those roads. Fowler Road is a favorite road for runners, for cyclists and walkers. It's shady in the summer and part of many recreational loops in town. I see young track team runners from school, many groups of cyclists, walkers with pets on leashes who must really run into the woods. <laughs> to get off the road uh, with the truck traffic. Um, there are alternatives to using Fowler Road for this level of traffic, and I'm here tonight to ask the town to pursue reasonable restrictions. I understand people have businesses to run, so do I. Um, I am not asking that you restrict the traffic Monday through Friday a reasonable amount of traffic on Fowler Road, but when it starts on the weekends, I think I have objections to that. And although it has been rare that it has happened, I'd rather get ahead of the game and ask for that restriction. Thank you. And I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Sir? Or, uh, this is a question for the town manager. I'm just trying to get a sense of the, of the geography. I know where the, the, the gravel pit is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the, the trucks have to go on Fowler Road one way or the other to get to 77, is that right? Mm. Th th that's correct. But it's very much near. So the direction, like that, the, middle. the direction that Ms. Guerre is talking about is going towards the high school. Towards Sprague Hall. She would prefer there be no weekend truck traffic between the town center and Sprague Hall except in that little section to get in and out of the pit to come this way. She wants them to go out and take a left, and it's just a very, they're right near 77, so it would just be a short jaunt, and then they would go right on 77, rather than traveling all the way down sure. Fowler and merging. Yes, right. they Is that okay. correct? I uh, just was trying to get a sense of. They go right, so they travel the whole length of it. Got it. Because it's, because it's a, they merge, sorry. Okay. That's all right. Bob Raftis, I'm here for Skip Murray. <clears throat> Skip's a longtime resident of Cape Elizabeth, as am I. And I just wanted to restate the facts that were in uh, Mike McGovern's memo to the board of the council that 
In essence, this is a DOT matter. Uh, it's been considered in the past, and for this board to refer it to the DOT, uh, it would have to come to the conclusion that there were safety concerns or excess damage to the road. Uh, neither have been alleged uh, or proven that, that there's any problems with what's going on. I understand that uh, having some trucks run on the road can be difficult for people who live upon the road. However, um, that pit's been there for 60, 70 years. Uh, Skip Murray is the pit that was referenced. Uh, L.P. Murray and Sons is a fourth generation um, business in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And the stated purpose of the highways uh, that the DOT puts out is that they are to contribute to the economic growth of the community. Um, right now there's a lot going on with uh, difficult times and economic times and right now with uh, Skip Murray's uh, just got done doing the project or they're finishing up the project on Shore Road and there has been some a little more use in the month of September to try to keep, bring that road in on time and that sidewalk and that uh, access point. So um, the commercial roads, uh, the roads that use commercial trucks, they, they do tax them very heavily. I mean they pay a heavy use tax, LP Murray and Sons, uh, they pay extra fuel tax, they pay for commercial stickers, and all those go back in to improve the roads and make the roads uh, safer uh, and uh, usable by such heavy vehicles. Uh, there's been no, uh, L.P. Murray and Sons had no safety violations uh, that Skip can remember in the last 20 years. Uh, they've also go through numerous DOT checks and inspections. They've passed every one with flying colors. So um, I, the uh, Movement uh, mentioned that uh, she's aware that the trucks seem to be uh, operating within the speed limits. We would agree with that. Again, we've had no safety violations of any kind. We employ approximately 15 people in the town of Cape Elizabeth, and uh, those people, uh, you know, it, it goes down a little bit in the winter because in the, as you get to this time of year and you're trying to finish up projects, the use of the roads increase a little bit uh, to try to bring those projects in on time and on budget. So, again, uh, that business has been there for over 60 years. It's a DOT matter, and, and this board's really charged with the, um, being kind of the gatekeeper to decide whether or not there have been safety allegations alleged or excess damage to refer this to the DOT. Um, we are not aware of any, uh, and again, for our particular business, and as far as the, the trucks that pass on that road, uh, as Skip said, he drives the trucks themselves. The, the, the vehicles can pass one another in a safe fashion. Uh, without any injury. There's been no accidents alleged. There's been nothing that's been alleged other than it's inconvenient or disruptive potentially to people who live upon the road. Uh, that does not meet the standard for this council to even pass it up to the DOT uh, based on what the DOT stated threshold is. Can I ask you a quick question? Setting aside the legality, what is the downside of taking a left and a right? In other words, why, if, if, if it's just the exact same easiness, why not make the residents happier? Well, well, firstly, the downside of making the left as you come out of the access point onto Route 77 really is the, is the of all the places on Fowler Road, is probably the worst for the, conven the uh, safety of the vehicles because the way that road's constructed, if you're coming down from Rudy's towards the center of town and you have to make a left-hand turn onto Fowler Road, you actually have to turn back against yourself, probably 130, 140 degree turn. If you have a 70 ton truck trying to make that turn on a regular basis, it's very difficult and you'll often see and skip and testify to the things that they have to back up a lot, they can't get around cars, cars are pulling out there trying to see the vantage point up and down the highway and those vehicles coming in from that perspective, it's very dangerous and of, the, of all the areas, that's the most difficult is that entrance point. So you would be putting all the traffic that way into that more difficult area. And we did a breakdown just when we knew this was forthcoming to kind of look at how our trucks go out. About 60% of the trucks take that left-hand turn out on a regular basis. About 40% of the trucks on a daily basis for our use, for LP Murray and Sons, make the right and go west on Fowler Road. So we're already about 60-40 split that way, but there's an economic cost. I mean, I know it doesn't sound like when you're running those trucks, some of those trucks get three to four miles a gallon. You pay an extra 30 to 40 cents a, for the diesel tax uh, on the fuel that you use. Over the course of time, it adds up. And we run about 15 trucks a day, uh, you know, out of five trucks we have, we run about 15, three uh, back and forth a day to the various job site, and one job, one truck works the pit. Frank, thank you. That's um, I think the proposal is due on, to have this restriction on weekends, and uh, it seems like a perfectly reasonable request just from, the, from a neighbor's standpoint in terms of having peace in the neighborhood, and I think, you know, your point about all these trucks, uh, if that would be a danger perhaps on a, uh, a regular day, but there's probably not much traffic on, uh, not many trucks moving on the road on the weekends, at least that's what the report was. Would that be that of an economic cost, significant economic cost or inconvenience 
if we're just talking about weekends? Well, obviously, it would lessen it, Frank, to the standpoint if you're using I mean, we don't run, as a general rule, on Sundays. Uh, we, this particular summer, we've run probably three Saturdays uh, where we've had to run trucks to, you know, again, to meet, meet the demands of the business. Um, but the, the concern here is, you know, you start to do this to, you know, and I, and I hate to use the, the, the old slippery slope. You start to say the DOT would, I think, shut this down in a heartbeat. They wouldn't I'm, consider I'm, I'm not talking about illegal. Yeah, I know. You're saying about agreements with neighbors. And, and, and see how it goes. See if you can do that without ever getting into even having to be in front of the council or issue any legal issue. Just doing it on the basis that, you know, we're neighbors. We've all been here a long time. Can we, can we do this and see how it works out? And we're always amenable to discuss anything with anybody. Um, that's why I say we don't run Saturdays as a, regular, as a regular course of business. There's only been three this summer, so, and we don't run Sundays. Three Saturdays uh, or three trucks? Three Saturdays. We've run three business. So we've operated three times approximately this, this summer on Saturdays, two to three. Um, so it's always something that we could consider. Uh, but then you get into the concern of you have, we're only, I mean, if we run 15, uh, approximately trucks and we run the five trucks three times 15 times and she's noticed up to 100 uses you have numerous other trucks that are coming through here and according to the again I hate to be statutory but as a lawyer you look at the statute if there's going to be an agreement to limit use all affected parties have to agree by consent otherwise it has to be mandated by the DOT as they're the only ones who have the right to mandate anything on weight and usage so while you could come into agreement with one particular entity that's only if, if her numbers are correct. You're looking at six other entities that are operating as much, if not more, than LP Murray and Sons on that road on a particular day, and they'd all have to be involved in that agreement. And that gets difficult the more parties you get to try to come to consensus. Thank you. Okay. Should Even we have a motion? Or do you, do you have a question for her? Yeah. Okay. Um, based on Frank saying trying to just accommodate the neighbors, you, you said that we already do a 60 40 split, but how many trucks come down the 50 miles an hour down 77 and make a left? into Fowler Road? I don't know. I, I wouldn't think many because they would just cut across Fowler. Because I'm, I'm looking at the angle of this turn, even if they were to try and appease the neighbors and do this, we're talking Saturdays, one of the busiest days traffic is probably moving, is uh, you're going to be trying to whip that truck around this really bad angle. It, it is the most, as, as Skip would tell you it's the most difficult part for his drivers is to negotiate that turn into the road making that left hand turn. They are big vehicles. I mean the heavy use vehicles are 55 tons or more. Right. And so um, going 50 miles an hour, how long, how soon down 77 they're going to have to start slowing down to well, make they, that turn? Um, you know any vehicle of that size would have to slow significantly prior to making that turn which again, and then you're also going to need enough space as cars are coming the other way to generate enough speed to get forward to make it across the turn. And if you have people coming out who are bikers or cars that are trying to get out, you could have a bit of a quagmire there that would be very difficult. As I said, there's been no accidents that we're aware of, and I would, you know, you could go to the, the public well, records. That's why I was asking how many, I mean, it looks like a pretty difficult turn and a not nice situation to put somebody driving a big truck like that into. That's why... I it is. And that we drive down Fowler Road for the purpose of avoiding that whole congestion and safety concern of that intersection. And I think that's one of the reasons that we do. Uh, as I say, it's one of the tougher turns to negotiate because you actually turn back against yourself. And I don't know what the degree would, but I'd say it's in the 130, 140 degree range. It's almost doing a U-turn. Right. Okay, let's have a motion and see. We may all be agreeing here already, so let's see where we are. Um, I would like to make a motion based on the facts and information presented tonight that the council not begin a process to petition the Department of Transportation to evaluate the proposal. I second that. Discussion? I just wanted to ask, uh, Mr. Graftus, it, it seems to me that also I'm concerned about the, the sharp left turn that you've been discussing, but <clears throat> also thinking in terms of economics in these times, it's a lot more it's a lot longer distance to take a right out onto 77 from Fowler and go all the way around. And higher speed. And higher speed to go all the way around, say if you're going to Scarborough, you know, or out that way, than it is to go Fowler. I mean, my guess would be at least six, five miles. I mean, I know they run if you went that turn. Yeah, four to and five I, miles. I would also like to say that that gravel pit has been there for a long time. It's not the only gravel pit on Fowler Road. Um, and that has, uh, my family owned a gravel pit on Fowler Road that supplied uh, uh, sand for the current high school. So what I'm getting at is that type of business 
has been on Fowler Road for a long, long time. I would agree. The pit, the, our particular pit has been there more than 60 years, and I know this isn't directed at us specifically, but in addition, we do a lot of t uh, work that L.P. Murray does for the town of Cape Elizabeth for their aggregate. So you increase uh, trucking costs. It's a major component to any job. Dave? I mean, I I, I, although I'm sympathetic to the, the request of the neighbor, I, I haven't really heard anything tonight that would cause me to believe that we ought to spend the town's resources or the Department of Transportation's resources on this request. There have been no safety issues. Uh, this business has been a responsible citizen for many years. It also sounds like the Saturday and Sunday traffic is very infrequent. And to go down this path, for what appears to me, with all due respect, to be a fairly minor issue, I just don't think is a, a, a good use of our resources uh, in terms of staff time, uh, representatives' times, et cetera. Uh, I, I, I just don't, I don't see why we should have, uh, move this to the, to the DOT. I also am concerned that there are other uh, businesses, maybe across town, that might be affected by this. Uh, who's to say that the abutters to, I think there's a gravel pit over off of uh, Sawyer Road? Uh, mm -hmm. they, is that where it's located? Uh, uh, by the same business. Okay, right. So those neighbors see, hey, well, we can maybe affect the traffic flow from that location. I, I just don't think I want to go down this path. Um, I, I'm sensing that most people feel that way, but I, I, I would like to say a little bit of a, a, a counter voice, which is, Skip, you're a great guy. Super nice, right? So. You know, I always think it's good, there's good room for compromise. So maybe the deal is, you know, that you talk to your truckers and if, there's a, if it's an easy split, like if they're just doing it habitually and not thinking about it, just, and there's no real compelling reason, then urge them to take the other one. Or, you know, if it's 60-40, maybe we can get to 60-40 the other way. Whatever, I mean, it's sort of an old fashioned, maybe you guys can talk and work out something where both parties are happier. So I agree with Dave that this doesn't rise to the level where it seems like we should get the DOT involved. I, don't, I agree with you that really I don't think they would choose to get involved. They would probably decline our request. But I do think that neighbors can talk to each other and work together and, and limit or ameliorate some of the more noisy. I mean, I understand your point. It's Saturday morning, you're trying to sleep, trucks are rumbling by. So all I'm saying is let's try to be good neighbors, try to compromise, and I would work echo it out a little bit. But I, I do think that I feel that we're thinking we will not take the legal step of getting people involved because I'm not sure there's that compelling a need, but I guess we should. I just one thing to address that. We have, I mean, just so you know, this complaint has been made before, and that's why we try to restrict our Saturday as, as it is down to three. I mean, if you look at the Saturdays, you're looking, you've got eight months a year as operations, so you have 34 Saturdays. We've used it three times. And when, when this came up a year or so ago, we asked the person who complained to kind of look at the trucks, and one of the things they were astounded by is a lot of trucks weren't ours. You had Mayetta Construction, you had uh, Gorham Sand and Gravel. So, I mean, this is the one point. It's not just our trucks. There's a lot of trucks. So that's the impact you'd have. We have tried to be a good neighbor. We don't have safety violations. Skip goes through a pretty good screening process to hire drivers. They've had no violations. They do go the speed limit, as you know, because we know we're driving big vehicles. So we have taken those steps. So I just want, Thanks. you know, we're just Thanks. trying to make a living. Yeah, and clearly yeah. it's not just, you know, LP Murray. That's why I was bringing up. The, the safety and, and the issues, like the reasoning why we don't do it. Because obviously those other trucking companies know that it's hard to make that turn for a reason. I mean, there's a reason why the trucks are going down there is what I'm, I'm saying. I mean, you can work it out as best you can, but until right. you get in a truck and you take that turn yourself, you know, you're going to understand why the trucks have to go down there so that they can continue to have great safety records. So, is there any more discussion, or are people ready to vote? Uh huh. Yeah. Back to the last word by Put you no, we'd be, be, be happy to look at that. Fowler Road was not built to very good standards initially, and we, we did a bit of a patch job uh, a couple of years ago, but knowing that, it, that it, at some point it really needs total reconstruction. And, and 
you know, and we'll continue, particularly on municipal projects, to work with all of any contractor we work with, and particularly the spring months, to to try to keep them traveling on that road because you know we don't we don't have a, a winter posting. You go to Scarborough, and every every place you turn, there's a sign up no trucks during the spring. We, we have worked very cooperatively with all the contractors in town without posting to try to get them to utilize roads reasonably, and you know we'll continue to do that. And we'll also continue in, in municipal contracts uh, when it appears that there might be quite a bit of traffic uh, in places we don't want them to, to try to even within our specs to, to direct the traffic. The advantage of that is people know up front what the rules are, and when they bid it, uh, they know that. But uh, we, we do try to be not only on Fowler Road, but throughout the town, uh, try to be respectful of, particularly if the town is generating the traffic, uh, to. Uh, to try to spread the burden so it doesn't all fall in one place. Have we, we have a motion and a second. So everyone ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion? Okay, thank you all. Item 129, uh, Rudy's, Rudy's property sewer easement. Uh, someone want to give a motion? I move that the town um, council consider a request to replace an existing sewer line easement with a replacement easement on Rudy's property. The former easement will be extinguished upon the acceptance of a new sewer line. And I believe the, there is a uh, copy of the deed as well as a, an exhibit that depicts what is being asked in your packet. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, second. Discussion? Jessica? Yeah, could, could Mike give us a little information on this? I just, I was, it was just sort of not unclear to me what the, yeah. what the situation is. I mean, I looked at everything, but I still couldn't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, happy to do that. The owner of Rudy's is actually 517 Ocean House LLC. And they plan to tear down the current Rudy's. They have a permit already from the planning board to build a new Rudy's. And as part of that, uh, the, the sewer lines aren't in the most opportune location. They've, they've worked very closely with Bob Malley uh, to connect, to change the sewer line easement so that it's in a place that's not only more advantageous for the business, but also more advantageous for the town. Uh, oh, okay. Why is it more advantageous for the town? Well, we don't want to be digging under a building uh, when they build a new building. <laughs> Why didn't I think that? <laughs> so then the pe director of public works is um, in um, agreement with the proposed change? Very much so. He's, he's worked with uh, the town engineer. He, he reviewed the plans uh, uh, with the developer's representative. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, okay, now is another opportunity for citizens to discuss any item that's not on the agenda, please. I'm sorry, do you mind? I'm sorry. My name is Kathy Klein and I live at 66 Cross Hill Road. And I'm just wondering if you're going to report on the gun club status. I know this was supposed to be addressed at this oh, meeting and it wasn't on the agenda. So. Yeah, I, I apologize. You're right. We had um, said at the last one that we would bring it up, and we did get uh, uh, email with a letter and an update. So I'll let the town manager address that. I apologize. We should have snuck it on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We we had asked the council had asked uh, for an update during this month. Uh, we did get actually emails today from both parties. Uh, one from Jamie Wagner, who's representing uh, the neighbors, and one from. Uh, Mark Maiman, who's representing the Spurden, Sporman Garage Gun Club. And the essence of it was, the essence of the two emails was that the, the Rod and Gun Club has, is working to, with a licensed range expert, safety, is, safety expert, a uh, gentleman who happens to be from South Portland. Uh, and they, they want to bring this person on to, to, to review it, to look at all the safety standards. Uh, Jamie uh, Wagner said yes they were interested in that they were pleased to see that but they wanted to review that person's qualifications okay. and they're in the process of reviewing that uh, those qualifications uh, 
the, the parties are working together, the parties are talking, uh, and the, the Rod and Gun Club also indicated that they had already started work on a fence, was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. was on a fence. So basically the parties are talking. We, we get the emails, and if you leave your email address with me, okay. I'd be happy to, actually, what, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll send them to our webmaster tomorrow okay. and ask her to just put a little update on the home page uh, uh, on the Spur and Karate and Gun Club, and, and we'll attach uh, the two emails uh, so oh. you can read what, exactly what they both said. I'm just curious. Um, a couple questions came up after the last meeting. If they're, I noticed there was a bulldozer there recently and they were doing some work. If they do construction there and change the scope of the gun club based on what the experts say, are they required to permit that work? Is there any intervention that the town takes to ensure that what they're doing is safe? I'm just wondering if the town intends to be any more proactive if we're talking about safety and we're talking about guns. I'm just, it seems like there needs to be more intervention on the part of the town. So. If, if I might, the, the code enforcement officer is the person directly responsible for overseeing any building construction right. and any, any land alteration in the community. Uh, the, you know, so any, any work they do that alters the land or that modifies the building does require permits. And you know they, they they are subject to the to those regulatory requirements. Most of those you know most of those permits are, are very simple. They don't right. they don't go to boards. They don't go to the planning board. They don't go to the uh, the zoning board because they're already in, allowed within the rules. Uh, you know if if there is you know any specific safety issue, you know we, we'll we'll also have the chief of police look at it. And again you know I I think you know I'm really pleased for one to see that. That they are having a, a, a certified license, whatever the title is, uh, inspector, safety inspector, come in uh, and look at it. And, and Jamie also mentioned Wagner, the, the representative of the neighbors, that they were also wanting to do a little bit more work and have discussion on the NRA safety requirements and doing, and they hope to have an assessment of current conditions versus the NRA safety requirements. So. You know, it's it, in in my view, it's good that there is that there is a dialogue going on now, and uh, you know, I think you know, I, I assume the council will want further updates uh, as time goes on. We'll be happy to share them with everyone as well. It'd be great to get an update by next month, I think, if we could, if they could settle on someone and come tell us, Frank. Mike, uh, to uh, address the concern about whether or not they'll follow through, um, if the safety expert gives a design and they all agree on it. That design basically goes to code enforcement, and then, then essentially whatever work they do will comply with that design. So in a sense, there's, there is town involvement to the extent to which our code enforcement ensures that whatever they propose is actually done, right? Yeah, but that's true, Frank, but they need to propose something to be done, right. the owner of the property, we, or they need to violate an existing ordinance. Right. Right. We, we, we can't force them to do things that don't meet either of those two requirements. Right. Whatever, if, if, assuming that all parties are happy with what the safety expert proposes, our role is just, our code enforcement's role is to follow through with whatever the design has been approved. We're not going to be designing it. Right. That's, the code enforcement, under the current ordinances and state law, the code enforcement officer's responsibility would be to review any application that's right. entered but he, he alone could not force the safety improvements Absolutely. Yeah. unless there was some specific provision, some specific ordinance being violated. Right. If there was a specific state law being violated or a nuisance to public safety, yeah. there's also some more general language that you know, we could look at what our options might be. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lucarelli's title is an NRA Certified Range Technical Team Advisor, short RTTA. Okay. I can understand why I didn't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I have a question. I, I've wondered what the condition of the soil is with all that, those bullets and lead for years lying there and soaking in and so forth, particularly if they were to s move things around or build or dig, then it stirs it all up. So. To me, that's part and parcel of safety. What is the, 
how would the town get involved with that or would we not? Is that a state law? Is that a federal law? Uh, is that something that should be required to be checked as well? You know, I, I'm not sure, you know, m most of those ground environmental issues tend to fall within the DEP jurisdiction. I don't know what approach the main DEP takes to, to gun rangers in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. So that would be the one. Okay. That's just an aside. It's not, it's not what they're wrestling with right now, but I just thought I'd mention it. Okay. My last question is, what if both parties don't come to an agreement on this expert? I don't know who. Then they have to find another. Okay. Because we had said at our council meeting it had to be mutually agreed upon. Right. Okay. Would the town be helpful in that regard? If they ask us, I assume, no? Yeah. No. If you, yeah. You know, the, the council has encouraged the parties to go out and to get this expert. The, the, the council, this was a discussion at a workshop. The, 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 there's no mandate that the council can do to require it. We, we're really looking for the cooperation of both parties, and that's fortunately what we've, what we've been having in the dialogue. The, the Rod and Gun Club is, is under new leadership in the last year or so, and they've been a lot more proactive at working with the town uh, at these different issues. And, you know, I, I you know, you know, the proof is always in, in the pudding, as, as they say. And, you know, I've seen a much more of a willingness to, to study issues, to work with the, co the community than in the past. And I don't, I don't mean to criticize, but, you know, times change. And I think the Rod and Gun Club understands that, you know, uh, that they would like to be responsive. And, uh, you know, they, they understand there's been safety issues at other facilities. And, you know, they want to be absolutely sure that, uh, everyone is safe uh, in the region. Uh, so will you have them report at the next meeting then? I hope so. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, I, I just want to clear. We can ask them to, but yeah. up, this is a voluntary process on, on their part. Yeah. But we, we, we will encourage them to do that. But I'm a, I'm a little bit sure of you know, what we do at meetings versus what we do at workshops and what we just get as written correspondence. We've got a, I'm a little bit nervous because we've got a hefty meeting on November 14th. We can just get a with, report, an update, it yeah. take two minutes. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll deal with that next month. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. We'll keep you updated. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Second. All those in favor?